Do you think there's been any introspection by the mainstream media about just how hypocritical their coverage of all of that was? No, no. And we're seeing it playing out right now with this whole Roe versus Wade uh, situation. Undivided is brought to you by 1530 Mortgage. Visit them at 1530mortgage.com. In 2020, riots and protests exploded across the country from here in Seattle down to Portland, Minneapolis, Kenosha, Wisconsin, Los Angeles, Washington, D.C. The riots and protests sparked a national conversation around policing in this country, but they also shined a glaring light on the state of the media and how the media in this country really has two standards for covering civil unrest. One of the journalists who found himself on the front lines of a lot of this unrest in 2020 was Julio Rosas. He is the author of a new book, Fiery But Mostly Peaceful, The 2020 Riots and the Gaslighting of America. Now, in case you're curious where he got the headline for this book, you'll probably remember the CNN report in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Here it is, the infamous still. <laughs> Doesn't get much worse than that. Julio Rosas borrowed that viral meme as the title of his new book. He and I spoke about it, as well as his experience covering riots across the country, including Seattle's infamous occupied protest known as CHOP. Julio Rosas, I appreciate you joining us. Introduce yourself for people who aren't familiar with your work. Uh, so uh, Julio Rosas, I'm the senior writer at Town Hall, the author of the new book, Fire Mostly Peaceful. i uh, covered a lot of the riots uh, in 2020 and even a little bit into 2021. And most recently, my uh, work has taken me a lot down to the southern border to cover the ongoing crisis down there, originally from the mediocre state of Illinois. Uh, and I moved, I moved out to DC after I dropped out of college in 2017. Marine veteran. Is that, is that true? Yes. Yes. I, uh, enlisted in the Marine Corps reserves in 2015 and I got out in May of last year. Awesome. Well, let's talk about the book. Obviously that's why you're here. The, the title's hilarious for people who aren't familiar, fiery, but mostly peaceful, uh, Omar Jimenez with CNN. I believe it was Omar Jimenez uh, standing in front of burned out buildings and cars with a CNN Chiron that calls the, uh, the protest uh, fiery, but mostly peaceful. A lot of dumb things were said by the press during the, the riots in 2020. Why was this the, the one you chose? Because it was the perfect encapsulation of what of what that year was in terms of the media coverage. Because obviously, the this, the the main story was the riots themselves, right? And you would think then then would because this is such a big event and because they just continue to happen uh, for much of 2020 and like I said, even a little bit into 2021. You would think the media would do a, a very good job with all the resources they have and social media and just like this big backing to, to get the story right. And yet, you know, even though, and you know, I've met Omar, I, I met him when I was cover, uh, the, covering the Rittenhouse trial in Kenosha. Um, and he, I think he's actually one of the few last good journalists over there at CNN. Uh, but it's, it's just, it's just so perfect that even though the reporter that's on the ground is actually like telling what's happening, it's just like a reflex for CNN to get something wrong because it makes BLM look bad. <laughs> and so the, it's just like a guy in the control room screwing over a very good reporter because that's what CNN does these days. And it's not just CNN, right? It, it, there's, there's, the book has many examples of kind of malpractice from you know, New York Times, the Washington Post, the USA Today, Reuters. Uh, but it, it, it's just, it also because of the meme. I mean, I woke up, I woke up the next morning in Kenosha after covering the, you know, the night's craziness. And I, and I remember seeing the screenshots of that. And I, and at first I thought, Oh, that's a really good Photoshop. I, that's that what someone, I thought too. Yeah. That someone did. And then I saw a friend of mine, he posted the video of it. So like, no, it's real. I'm like, are you, are you kidding me? And, and even with, and even with uh, in Kenosha, the Kenosha riots as they were happening, I mean, CNN, like I said, was far from the only one that was, doing just idiotic things like that. But I mean, just because it's so popular. So I was going through several iterations of, of the title and, and funny enough, the other, the, the, the second title I was going with, and this is the main reason why I'm here with your show uh, was because I wanted to call it the uh, summer of chaos. It was, you know, a little bit of a riff on summer of love from, yeah. from, from Chaz and all that. And so uh, there was no way the title was not going to be somewhat meme related just because I really love memes. But uh, prior to Mostly Peaceful was definitely just kind of like the, in my mind, the, like the, the perfect encapsulation of, of the media malpractice to, to parody. 
And we'll get into some of that. There's a lot to, when you look back at that summer, the summer of love, um, there's a lot that happened. There's a lot to unpack. You were covering riots and protests across the country. For you, so to look back at that summer and decide, okay, what do I want to put into a book? What were you trying to accomplish with the book? What did you want people to come away from it uh, with us? So the main thing that I wanted to accomplish with the book, uh, so there, there's two main things. One is just to detail a lot of these riots because I was in a unique position, right? Because, I mean, unless you were, you know, someone in Portland or Seattle, um, uh, you know, a local reporter there, there wasn't a lot of people traveling just like, I mean, literally it was coast to coast and it was during the era of COVID. So, I mean, that was another layer of why people didn't necessarily travel, even, even journalists. And so I was in a unique position that granted, yeah, I didn't see every single ride, right? I couldn't be everywhere at once, but I went to, as it turned out, like the really big ones, the really important ones, like Minneapolis, Shaz, Kenosha, uh, yeah, just, uh, so I wanted to, I wanted to put all that into a book and put it, and this is the second point, to really put it into a physical medium of my experiences because all, all of it's online. Prior, prior to all this, all my work has been online and you know that, that's fine, you know, the internet's there, it's great, but uh, with, you know, especially from a conservative standpoint with big tech and Twitter being in flux of how it is with who's in charge and the rules and all that. So it was also just to kind of, uh, you know, just make sure that there's a physical written record uh, typos and all uh, with, uh, of, of my experiences. And because I, I, I was in a lot of places, uh, uh, during, during that time. I think you brought up an interesting dichotomy in the book where I worry about Americans, because if you've got, you know, CNN one day, they've got burned out cars and vehicles behind them calling it fiery, but mostly peaceful. And then fast forward, you've got talking heads on MSNBC calling the January 6th, uh, riot worse than than 9-11. I mean, do you think there's been any introspection by the mainstream media about just how hypocritical their coverage of all of that was? No, no. And we're seeing it playing out right now with this whole Roe versus Wade uh, situation. And, 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 you know, obviously I wrote and finished all this way before this all happened. But again, we're seeing like we're, we're, cause just yesterday I was at a protest. It was peaceful, but it was at a protest at Justice Alito's house over here in, in Virginia. And, you know, there's, from my point of view, non-legal expert, it, and that's technically breaking that law, that statute to not intimidate judges. Uh, and yet uh, Jen Psaki just today was saying, well, as long as it remains peaceful, we, we, we encourage this type of thing. And it's, they're, they're making excuses again. All, I mean, they, they, and it's not just, you know, Democrats, but again, it's, I've written for town hall recently, all these kind of examples of, people within the media you know, justifying or, or excusing or putting in context these protests at Supreme Court justices' homes to intimidate them to change their ruling. And so, no, they haven't learned because, and they haven't learned because, I mean, was anyone fired uh, with CNN for that, Chiron? With, with, you know, Ali Velshi is still, you know, at, at, at MSNBC. And it, all, all these reporters who, who, who downplayed uh, these riots, especially in the aftermath of January 6th, um, no, no one took anything from it. And so, of course, I mean, they, they, they're, they're, they have, there's so much hubris, there's so much uh, self uh, inflated sense of self importance that they, they think that no one can touch them. And, and, and it's been, I mean, that is kind of true, right? I mean, because there, there's just no media accountability. So when there's no accountability, they, they're just, they're just going to run the same playbook all over. Again. So when we're looking forward to the future with this whole Roe versus Wade, and it's eventually overturned, if it is, and then there is another maybe explosive reaction to that potentially, then how is the media going to cover it? And I can tell you, I, I think they're going to do it all over again. Yeah. And one of my big things I always preach to people is actions before affiliation is really judging people based on their behavior and whether that behavior is appropriate without any care or consideration for their political affiliation. And I will say um, from the perspective of um, a moderate, the, the January 6th riot on the flip side, you know, there are uh, conservatives who try to downplay the seriousness of that as well. And to me, it just undercut the frustration that they had expressed for so long with the left downplaying the riots that happened in the summer of 2020. Do you feel like the right has been um, hard enough on those who participated in January 6th? Yeah, I mean, I, I talk about like if I provide an example in the book when I talk about my coverage in January 6th, because initially a lot of people, um, you know, not a lot of people, but uh, some people on the right were wanting to blame Antifa for it and Antifa infiltrators, BLM infiltrators. And there was that one case of John Sullivan, who was a BLM activist from Utah, 
But uh, as I explained, that one of the big reasons you can tell that this wasn't by and large, you know, Antifa individuals is because a lot of people who entered the Capitol, they didn't wear face coverings. And as someone, and especially you know, as someone who's dealt with Antifa, I'm sure a lot in Seattle, they do a very good job. They take painstaking measures to hide their identity because they don't want to be caught so they can continue out doing things. These people, on the other hand, uh, you know, people didn't wear face coverings. They didn't hide their identities. And, and you know, just looking through the indictments and looking out through all these people, a lot of these people who, you know, broke in or were, or were let in like that one door, uh, which is weird, by the way, but yeah. they, they, they were they, they were they were Trump supporters. And so for me, from my perspective, it's just look, this is why it's so hard for, as a country to address these issues, because when we look at how the left, you know, is trying to portray and justify the riots and how, you know, some of the right are trying to downplay January 6th. It, it's no, look, they were, they were, <laughs> they were riots. Uh, was January 6th an insurrection? In my opinion, I don't think so because it gives it too much credence because it was just so disorganized. Uh, you know, and I, and I provide an example where people were, I, I got into the rotunda and people were coming up to me asking if I knew what the plan was. And I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and it, it, and it's just, and it highlights that they didn't realize how far they would be able to get into the Capitol. And that's because for whatever reason, despite, you know, coming off a year of riots and despite these warnings, the, the Capitol Police leadership did not adequately prepare for it. And there's, there's multiple government faults on that level. So it is frustrating to, for anybody uh, or to, to see anybody just downplay these riots, because as, as someone who's seen the effects of it all over the country, it, it's very, very devastating. When it comes to Seattle, I think your perspective on this is interesting. As you know, I didn't get to spend uh, any time in CHOP because my crew was, we well, well, had to seek refuge in a fire station. So we didn't uh, get to experience it firsthand. And your your perspective is interesting to me because you don't, you're not soaking in Seattle politics. I mean, you've definitely been here covering things. Um, so from your perspective as an outsider to the Seattle uh, uh, experiment, give me just sort of your 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 thoughts on what it was like uh, to be there and to to witness CHOP's formation firsthand. It, so I, I kind of compare it in the book, I kind of compare it to the episode in South Park where the hippies take over the town. <laughs> and yeah. except except this time, like real people were actually killed in this case, unfortunately. Uh, but in terms of seeing the formation of it, so yeah, you know, because so you were there that first night after they kind of took it over, but then obviously you had to leave <laughs> for your own safety. So I got in the next day because I, I, I booked the flight initially to because I was still expecting to cover riots outside the East Precinct. And right before they were saying, well, no, we're going to actually evacuate. So I was going into this thinking like, I have no idea what's about to happen. Like, I think I actually just wasted company money because <laughs> nothing's going to happen now. But then when I started to see, oh, wait, no, they're setting up a zone and they're calling it a cop free zone and you're leaving the United States of America. I'm thinking, all right, let's let's just see how this plays out. And really, it was it, I, I compared to uh, a newborn uh, cult or foal trying to get its legs after, you know, after it's born and trying to stumble around. And, and it just it just never found its legs. And that's for a variety of reasons. I mean, the activism class within Seattle is very, very strong and very unique, but it's made up of a lot of different players. So part of the problem was that because there was no central leadership, there was just constant kind of changing of the guard. And, and that would happen, you know, throughout the day, because obviously not everyone's going to be there all the time, 24 seven, everyone needs to have sleep at some point. So it, it was, it was just interesting to see how they were trying to take over this place so that it could, no, no cops are no longer allowed inside. And, and as, as I explained a little bit at the, at the beginning, uh, the city was constantly acquiescing to them. They were just mm -hmm. constantly giving into their demands because, because in my opinion, the, the Democrat, Democrat city leaders didn't want to make it seem like they were cracking down on racial justice protesters because that looks bad. And, mm -hmm. and yet, as, as we saw it evolve, and even within that first week, I could tell right away, like, this is not going to end well. People are going to get hurt and probably killed. And like I said, unfortunately, that happened. Were you surprised as kind of an outsider to the political scene in Seattle that they acquiesced so quickly to the demands of the the people in Chaz Chop? Yeah, because I because I, Jenny Durkin, I, I can't remember if it was the week I was there or shortly after that. I think it was like towards the end of when I was there. But Jenny Durkin visited Chaz. She visited kind of the outskirts by 
more by the tent city and Cal Anderson Park, not not necessarily right by the, the intersection. And she, you know, talking about, oh, this is great, and it's great to see people getting involved in these tough issues, and you know, just po- wa- you know, politely waxing about how this is a great. And then, of course, then yes, she then went on CNN and said, "We'll have a summer of love." And during the whole time I was there, I saw people within Chaz trying to gather recall petitions to recall Jenny Durkin. Yeah. So it's the, it's like, why are you giving so giving in so much to these people who hate you? They you could literally give every single demand that you want, and they still are going to make sure you get kicked out of office. And so you're so you're 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 hurting the 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 people the residents who live there because there's about two or three apartment complexes that was right within the zone. The businesses that were in and around near the zone. So you're 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 hurting their quality of life too. And for for what? Because you don't want to seem like you don't want to. You want to seem like you're uh, following Donald Trump's, you know, su- you know, suggestions on Twitter about taking the city back, and so therefore then you're just going to give a hands-off approach as much as you can, and it just it doesn't make any sense. And so learning more about, you know, and then I, I got I, I heard of Kashama Sawan or, or how do you pronounce her name? Yeah, Shama Sawan. Shama Sawan. Yeah. So I, I I have heard of her before because you know she has made national headlines every once in a while. So I was already aware of her, but. I mean, I, I was with the march when she let everyone into the city hall. And, I, and of course, I, I didn't know it at the time that it was because of her, because I was, I was towards the back. But I quickly found out that they were let in because she had the key. <laughs> and so it was just it, it's just it was very interesting because I had been to Portland before. So, I, was, I, I you know, I'm very familiar with the Pacific Northwest progressive craziness. But uh, obviously, Seattle is a different flavor of that. And so it was very interesting to see that all play out in both with the elected officials and with and with the activists. And there's actually a point you write in the book about how um, the chop folks confused you for one of them and you just sort of rolled with it, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, so that's what's great about being Hispanic <laughs> is that <laughs> at these things, because, yeah, I, I, I this is like probably the first hour I'm there and people just automatically assume that I was there to help things out. And of course, I wasn't going to be like, well, actually, I work at a conservative news outlet. I've done a couple of <laughs> before. Uh, so I just I, I just roll with it. And so I, I helped them bring supplies in further into the zone that were that were donated. We were at the, the, the gay nightclub, The Cuff. Uh, and so I was able to kind of really see how how this was kind of they were trying to like build logistics and all that. Uh, now, of course, as time went on, and I did go on Fox News a few times while I was there, so some people were trying to figure out finally who I was. But it was it was just interesting that that because then the, people's main concerns were keeping out white supremacists, and that's why they needed the barriers. That's why they needed the the, the strict quote unquote like border checkpoints <laughs> policies that that they had. Uh, but you know, they saw me just a brown guy, and they're like, oh yeah, yeah, he's good. Um, well, you know, just kind of to end with this, I think. There's a lot of, as you said, mistrust in the press in how they've covered unrest in this country. Um, what advice, I guess, would you have for Americans who are trying to figure out how to get the truth about what's happening at some of these protests and some of these riots across the country? I mean, it, it's it's consuming the media that from from people who are actually there a lot of times. I mean, because it, it, no one's going to get everything 100% right. Like, I mean, I've made mistakes in my career. Uh, you know, no, no one's perfect. But again, it's, it's what you do when you find out about your mistakes, right? Uh, and I think that's, that's very telling. And for a lot of times, again, the media at large, just, you know, since it's kind of a club where everyone's in, a, in with each other, they're, they're more than happy to just kind of look the other way or not, not make as big of a deal as maybe they should. But in terms of in terms of you know being, well one I mean they can definitely buy the book <laughs> pretty pretty trusted source on that one I, I'm happy to say <laughs> yeah but but it's just there there were, there were other independent people uh, out there you know it wasn't just me thankfully you know, I've, you know there's the whole riot squad that that came to be because we we wanted to watch each other's backs we wanted to you know make sure that we were all safe but also because as like with the Rittenhouse case having as many camera angles in that case was pop- was was good because it really helped paint a clear picture in a very muddy situation. And unfortunately, you know, the mainstream media was not there. It was, it was, you know, all the videos were from random citizens live streaming, myself, a handful of people at the Daily Caller, uh, and, and a few independent like, journalists. And so it's you have to seek them out. You're like you really have to you have to find them and 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 support support their work because you know uh, even though yeah I work at Town Hall 
even working at a company like Town Hall, we I, we don't have, we can't nearly compete with the resources that plays like CNN or MSNBC have. And yet we still do a better work <laughs> when it comes to things like this because we actually you know, put forth the effort to be accurate in, in these situations. If you like videos like this, be sure to become an undivided subscriber on Patreon or Locals. That's patreon.com forward slash undivided or become a contributor on my Locals community, brandycruise.locals.com. Thank you to the founding sponsor of Undivided 1530 Mortgage. Visit them at 1530mortgage.com.